afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so to kind of introduce myself, I'm a, I'm a pediatric interventional cardiologist. Um, just so I have a kind of idea of who my audience is, how many of you have congenital heart disease? Now I know my audience. I won't even ask any other questions. So how many of you have had a heart catheterization? How many of you have had a heart catheterization after you became an adult? How many of you have had one surgery? How many of you had two surgeries? How many of you had more, three or more surgeries? Excellent. So I asked some of these questions for a variety of reasons. First of all, is why is a pediatric interventional cardiologist standing in front of you? Um, part of that is because I would, I would, I guess another question I would ask is, how many of you, after you were an adult, had a catheterization done by in a, in a children's hospital? So that's why I asked. <laughs> so oftentimes we find ourselves, despite our training being principally in working with children, in fact, all morning I was spending my time with children that were about this big instead of adults like yourself. In fact, I spend very little time talking to you. I spend most of my time talking to your parents. Um, but we often find ourselves, because we deal all the time with the heart conditions you were born with, we tend to kind of understand a little bit better about what we're facing when we take into the catheterization laboratory. And I talk about surgery a little bit because one of the challenges that you present is every time you go to surgery, it's that much harder for the surgeon because they've already been there and the different scar tissue and things that form make it a lot harder. In fact, in some cases, by the time you're to your third, fourth, or beyond surgery, it takes more time just to get to the heart than it does to actually do the surgery that you went in for. And so, fortunately, there have been a lot of advances that Dr. Linnett had alluded to that have allowed us to do things that prevent the need for surgery and oftentimes can get you back on your feet and home a lot sooner. And so, the goal for me today, because Dr. Lin's going to show some a lot of more fun and crazy things that we've done, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the basics of uh, some of the types of um, interventions that we do. And also because no one really believes I can do this in 15 minutes, I've kind of reduced this mostly down to, to pictures and movies. So, <laughs> one of the conditions that we see quite a bit are uh, patients have coarctation of the aorta. Just a simple diagram that shows that otherwise a normal peering heart, but right here, there's a blood vessel that all of us had when we were born that went away. And for some, when that blood vessel goes away, it forms a narrowing in this blood vessel. And so, one of the things that we can do, one of the earlier things that we would do, is we would do a angioplasty. And this is kind of what this looks like in, in reality. So you have the blood vessel, and it narrows down right in this area to something very small. And all these other blood vessels everywhere is your body's attempt to get around it. So we can take a balloon, and you can see that waist in the balloon that expands, and that was where that narrowing is. And then you're left with With this, so you have a widening of that, and you're a lot happier. Although we found that that doesn't always give you the, the the most favorable results. So sometimes we find something like this, where the catheter is even too big, and it almost completely obstructs any flow. So we take a, a structure, a stent. How many of you have stents? Yeah. So if you know, you know who that what that is, and so basically it's just a metal framework that we're able to crimp down onto a balloon, kind of like the balloon that you already saw. And in this case, I know, and I remember this one, I was actually in Bolivia when I did this, it was a 24-year-old young man. And this, this stent actually has a covering on it, so that in case the, the blood vessel tears um, were protected. But this went up, and then this is, what, this is what we were left with. And at the end, so he went from having very high blood pressure to having normal blood pressure, and actually being able to feel pulses in his legs afterwards. So another thing that we'll see is aortic valve disease. And so actually we had, uh, we, were, we heard mention of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, something that happened to Arnold Schwarzenegger is he had um, an abnormality of his aortic valve. And over the years, uh, his, not only did his biceps get big, but also it had some effect on his valve. And now he actually has had surgery to replace that valve. So before we can get to surgery, sometimes we're able to do something about that in the cath lab. So here you have uh, an, uh, a contrast injecting the left ventricle. And there's the valve, you can see the nice white lines, which you actually don't see all that clearly if your valve is normal. So take a balloon, and again, there's where the narrowing is, and as you can see that kind of popping of the edges, that's when we know that we hopefully made a difference. 
and didn't make your valve leak, and then that's the result. And the result is shot above to make sure that we don't have any leaking of that valve. And so again, if you have a good result like this, you didn't have to have open heart surgery, you didn't have to go and bypass, and you may never need anything until maybe a lot further down the road if that valve causes problems again, which as much as I would love to tell you that it will never have problems again, it likely will, but if, if you have your first surgery is when you're 60 years old or 40 years old versus when you're six months old, that's probably better. We can have problems with the pulmonary valve, uh, just the same, same, kind of the same, serving a similar function for one of the outflows of your heart, only the one that goes to your lungs. And this just shows a picture of that, and there's the valve up there, it's really thick and ugly. There's the balloon. We open that up, and then we end up with a nice result where the, the valve is opening a lot better, and again, the avoidance of surgery. It's kind of interesting how this particular procedure evolved. It evolved because initially surgeons would go in and they would open up the valve and they would open up the leaflets of the valve. And then they realized, you know, maybe we can get away with this without going on bypass. And so they started making a decision they would put a dilator up and push through. And that's when, you know, a cardiologist comes along and says, well, you know, I could probably do that without having to make any incisions. And that's kind of how these things, many of these things evolve. Um, atrial septal defects, one of the more common heart diseases that we find. And in this case, it's where you have a hole between the upper chambers of the heart. And here's on an echocardiogram, which I'm sure the great majority of you have. And where you hear, you have this hole in between these two chambers, which again, actually can be a rare cause of the whole pulmonary hypertension that you hear about if nothing's ever done. And fortunately, we don't see a lot of pulmonary hypertension due simply to a ASD because they're so frequently encountered. But in some of my trips overseas, I've seen pe uh, people with Eisenmenger syndrome, irreversible pulmonary hypertension, because they had a defect like this that was never treated. And these are just some of the tools that we have. Uh, we have the Amplatz Receptal Occluder, which was the first to come to a wide, uh, widespread use. And this is just a picture of that device being placed. Uh, the Helix Septal Occluder came later, and actually as recently as uh, is in the early 2000s. And then it, this device has essentially been replaced very recently, as in last summer, with the Gore Septal Occluder that actually they're calling something different now. Cardioform. Cardioform, thank you. Um, it's kind of like generic versus the uh, <laughs> legal name. So this is just kind of an example. Yeah, we put a balloon in the heart. You kind of measure what size the device should be. And then here's just the release of the device and the device sitting in the, in the heart. No, it's not floating in free space. Um, then we have other types of defects, ventricular septal defects. And in this case, the hole is in the lower chambers of the heart. And this picture shows how many different kinds of VSDs. So if you had a VSD and you had to have surgery, don't feel bad. The great majority of them do require surgery. But if we're lucky enough that their hole is down here or kind of in the in the mid portion of the ventricular septum, there's a chance that we might be able to do something about it. If it's up high near the valves, um, it's something that we, it, for the most part, can't, although stay tuned, that actually might be changing in the future. And so this is just an example. This is the catheters in the left ventricle, and you see this is the right ventricle over here. So let's see if I can play that again. You see kind of right in this area, there's a, what appeared to be two holes, one big hole there, but it's actually two holes. And to kind of emphasize something that's coming in a minute, this is kind of how we close them. We actually put a wire that kind of goes up from your artery, down into the heart, across the hole, then up into your lungs. We grab this wire, and we pull it out so that we can deliver the device this way. So it's, it's kind of convoluted and uh, very, we kind of call this almost wire origami. And, but ultimately, you end up where you're able to cross the defect, release um, the device. In this case, there was a second device that, because there were, there were the two defects. Now, sometimes um, we, there are circumstances, and I will say I probably encountered this more before we did, in, in children than we do in adults, but sometimes we can't close these, either because the child is too small, and doing that wire origami that I showed you would just be too disruptive to the child or the surgeon can't get to it because of the location of the defect that requires a big procession. So we work, instead of working in competition, we work in collaboration with our surgeons. And so it's, we, while we may not be able to avoid a surgery, we might be able to avoid a bypass, 
uh, an extended stay in a, in a hospital. So if you if you don't like blood, you might want to turn your head. There's a little bit of blood on this next uh, video. So here we have uh, a wire being placed through a needle directly into the heart and across the defect. This is all by echo, being guided by echo. And then from there, we will then put the introducer sheath. So this is usually what goes in your leg. We actually just kind of push it right through the heart. You know, no incision was made in the heart. We just kind of push it right through. And these are the little white things are actually for afterwards. And then there's the introducer. We can see it looks like a straw across the hole. And we can get the device ready. And then we'll see the device coming out on this other side. So this is your left ventricle, and that's your right ventricle. And then the other side will be released. Heart's a little happy. That was the heart jumping, saying thank you so much. And this is afterwards. And you can see that there's very little flow. There's a little bit of flow going through. But as a result of this, we were, in this case, this was actually a very young child. They were able to avoid a much bigger surgery with a much larger um, uh, recovery time. And the nice thing about this, as much as this seems complicated and complex, I've actually found that this is a great alternative when I've gone overseas and had surgeons that are maybe a little bit less experienced, and interventional cardiologists that may be a little less experienced, and we've been able to teach them to do this, um, and we've been able to, able to do this in several countries, where they can do this and make their, their ability to advance their programs a lot faster. Um, another defect that's uh, probably, uh, some of these big ones, at least problematic, is uh, the patent duct arteriosis. And this was actually one of the earlier uh, device implants that we were doing. Um, the, back in 1992, someone had the idea to, to Camby had the idea to put in a coil and from that, we later had, uh, we were able to close these PDAs, which are these blood vessels that com communicate with your systemic blood flow to your lung blood flow. And then later, other devices, such as the uh, Nitoclude, which is interesting, although it was first used very early on, it actually was, it was only recently FDA approved. And then the uh, Amplatzer ductal occluder, which is probably the mainstay of what we use for closing PDAs. And that just shows kind of the example of the device being deployed and then we release it. And then this is a more, the more recent advance, advance that Dr. Lin talked to, which is the melody valve. And so the melody valve, for all intents and purposes, as you can see, it's a stent, like many, many of the stents that we use in coartations and in any blood vessel that might be narrowed, with the difference that they have sewn a valve, a valve that actually comes from a cow's jugular vein. So they take the vein from the cow's neck that has a valve in it, and after it passes a, a, quite a, a litany of tests, they sew it into this, uh, this uh, platinum iridium stent, and then it's crimped down on a balloon and, uh, and delivered across your pulmonary valve. And this way, if you have a conduit, for example, if you had to have your pulmonary valve replaced with a conduit, and over time it had a problem, some of you may have had another conduit placed in, and maybe even another conduit placed. But what we can do now is after you've had the conduit placed, and sometimes in certain circumstances, even before an initial conduit, we can place this valve. And when this valve doesn't work anymore, we can place in another valve. And so we can, instead of having four, five, six, or more surgeries over the course of your lifetime, you may only need one, or maybe two. So this just kind of shows an example. Uh, an injection was placed. This is kind of the sideways view. And the reason you're seeing contrast all the way up here and all the way back in is because that valve isn't doing anything. But after the, the valve has been placed, you can see nothing comes back. And so here's an example of a, of a patient that uh, Dr. Lin and I worked on. And this just kind of shows with the MRI, the narrowing. And this was just some uh, 40 flow. This is kind of a new technology that they've been working on here at the Methodist Hospital. It shows this, where the stenosis is in. This correlates with the CT scan that was done. And this is just some of the preparatory work. And so in this case, what you have is this is actually a stent um, that doesn't have a valve yet. And there's the, this valve that isn't functioning anymore. And this is going to be deployed to be kind of a landing zone. 
So it's been deployed, and now you've got nice wide open leaking, so we are not really any better than we started. And this is just a rotational angiogram, again, just another one of the tools that we're able to use to be able to better assess what we're doing. And then once we have this, we can do a, a three-dimensional reconstruction, and then overlay that three, uh, three, 3D reconstruction over your moving heart, and this is the deployment of another stent to make sure the landing zone is exactly as we want it. And then comes the deployment of the melody valve. So the melody valve is deployed, and then, although it's not great with the lighting, you see the injection, but nothing comes back. And so instead of having to go undergo a surgery with all the dissection that I talked about, this, this patient was able to have this valve and in most circumstances can go home the next day. So just kind of a little word about the future, at least my future, I hope, is uh, one of the new technologies out there, and this is mostly that the adult cardiologists are seeing because these stents um, were instead of being made out of metal, these are, this are made out of a polymer that once it's in, placed in, over a period of time, anywhere from six months to two years, they disappear which is great for coronary arteries, doesn't really help me much, but uh, one of the opportunities it offers as this technology becomes more mainstream is, and this is actually just, this is actually the, the, the one stent that's being uh, undergoing FDA trials in the US, the Abbott Absorb stent. And this will just kind of show you just a quick little video that shows that the stent is expanded. This is a coronary vessel, the one vessel that I actually don't go into. Dr. Mendez. does. Um, and then uh, over time, it starts to break down. And this is showing actually a drug that's being put into the blood vessel while, while it's going through this process. And then over time, it will break down. And the breakdown that's interesting is as it breaks down, it breaks down into lactic acid, which is something that your body produces. In fact, if you ever go running, and afterwards you kind of feel the cramps in your legs, that's actually from the lactic acid that's burned as a product of, of that. And it also breaks down into water and carbon dioxide, and then it's gone. Now the benefit of that, particularly for me, is I put stents in places sometimes where you're still growing. So when you were kids and had things being done to you, one of the reasons why they may have avoided putting a stent in is because they knew you were going to keep growing, and the stent's not going to grow. But with something like this, it doesn't need to grow because it will go away. And this is just a couple examples. Uh, again, in children, but it gives you an idea of some of the things that we're going to be able to do. They actually use this magnesium alloy stent that, um, that has been made in Germany, and this was a child that had um, no blood flow to the left lung. And it was a product of a uh, complication that happened during a surgery. And so they went in, got across, put in a, 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 bio, a biodegradable stent, and were able to resume flow to the left lung, and then the stent went away and then the child was able to grow normally. Um, this is another example of a, and this was actually the first one ever reported. This is an example of a child who was born with a coarctation, and where normally this is a child that would go to surgery. So usually when it comes to coarctations, it tends to be when you're older that we will um, act. They took this young child in, they put in a biodegradable stent that allowed them to repair this without surgery as a, as a, as a newborn infant. And again, if something more needs to be done, they can still do these kinds of things over and over. The problem we have simply is we just don't have these tools available in the sizes that we need yet. And so, in summary, there are many ways to treat patients without surgery. That's the kind of the, the uh, reason for our existence. I don't want to downplay the role of our surgeons, who I consider my friends and my great collaborators, because there are many times where we've been able to find things that actually Dr. Lynn will share, that we can do things because of them. And there's things, and, um, and there are many alternative therapies that are in place and currently in development, so stay tuned. Thank you.